It's time to learn some more applications of the solubility of ionic compounds and KSP. Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and this is another video in my complete AP Chemistry course series. If you uh, haven't already subscribed, I, I encourage you to hit that button. I don't want you to miss a thing. Now, in this video, we're going to be looking at some applications. So here are some problems. These types of problems sometimes pop up on the AP Chemistry exam, especially the multiple choice section. For example, something like this. Let's say we have 0 0.20 molar sodium chloride, and we start adding it dropwise just to buy drops in like a little eyedropper, to a beaker containing these two solutions. So it's got 0.3 molar lead 2 nitrate and 0.3 molar mercury uh, nitrate. Which of the precipitates is going to form first? So what we have to do here is look at the KSP values and compare them to each other. Remember, the substance that has the smaller the tinier magnitude KSP is the one that's least soluble and is going to precipitate out first. So in that case, or in this case, that means that the answer is going to be lead 2 chloride. That's because it has the smaller value for KSP. And so when we compare these, we can say, yeah, lead 2 chloride is less soluble than uh, that mercury 2 chloride. It'll take a little longer to make the mercury 2 chloride start to precipitate out. Let's take a look at another example that we could have here. This is something called the common ion effect. And this has to do with the fact that if we already put, uh, in this case, some calcium ions or some uh, sulfate ions into a solution of, uh, let's say, having a, a distilled water, you're not going to be able to dissolve as much calcium sulfate in there as if you would if there were a pure distilled water solution. So let me show you an example of what that means. Let's say that we have a saturated solution of calcium sulfate. That means that essentially this solution is loaded up all the way to the maximum available amount with both calcium ions and with sulfate ions. And remember, this is at equilibrium. If it's saturated, saturated means it's at equilibrium, right? So what's going to happen if we decide to toss in some solid sodium sulfate? Well, remember, if we have a solution at equilibrium, saturated, and we disturb that solution at, at that equilibrium, well, that sounds basically like a Le Chatelier's principle problem, isn't it? Or a Le Chatelier's principle question. And so by tossing in some solid sodium sulfate, the sodium isn't really going to do anything, but the sulfate, by tossing in the sulfate, we're basically adding a product, aren't we? And any time you add a product, equilibrium always shifts in the opposite direction, doesn't it? So we toss in the sulfate, that's going to shift equilibrium to the left, which means that we're going to make calcium sulfate precipitate. That's what you would expect to see. And so whenever you have a question like this, it's just an application of Le Chatelier's principle. So don't worry too much about the common ion effect uh, as being anything other than just Le Chatelier's principle, or just an application of that. Let's try an example here. Let's say that we have a chemistry student that has a saturated solution of silver iodide in a beaker. Which of the following solids, when added to the solution, is going to result in a solid precipitate of silver iodide being formed? Now, before we go too much farther in this, it might be nice to write out the actual equation so we can see what's going on here. So silver iodide, of course, is a solid, and its uh, dissociation would be into silver ions, aqueous, and iodide ions, which of course are also aqueous. And so remember, if you want to make a solid precipitate of silver iodide, that means you want to shift this equilibrium to the left. And the way that you do that is by adding product, right? You'd either have to add silver ions or iodide ions. Now, there aren't any of these four that have silver ions. So 
The silver is not going to be a factor here, but the iodide, there is one of these that does have iodide, and hopefully it jumps out at you at this point, right? It's, it's choice D. And so by adding that potassium iodide, you're adding iodide ions, and it's going to shift that equilibrium to go back to the left and produce that silver iodide precipitate. Now here's another question, very uh, typical of something that you might see on an essay question, for example. Calcium fluoride. It's very soluble in pure distilled water. It's less soluble in fluoridated tap water and almost completely insoluble in benzene. So explain these observations. Well, from a conceptual point of view, we can think of this as you know, if you have distilled water and a solution, it can only hold a certain amount of calcium and fluoride, right? It's kind of got that capacity. And if you go beyond that, well, you aren't going to be able to, to, uh, to, to dissolve as much. Well, in distilled water, if you have pure distilled water, there are no calcium or fluoride ions. You can load it up. You can dissolve all kinds of calcium fluoride in that, can't you? But if you have fluoridated tap water, well, you already have some fluoride in there, don't you? So you're, you're, you've increased the amount of fluoride, so you have less calcium fluoride that you can dissolve in there. There's, there's, there's less capacity to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to dissolve that. And how about a benzene? Well, benzene is a nonpolar organic solvent, isn't it? And ionic compounds just don't dissolve very well in these uh, nonpolar or organic solvents. So, so here's, here's the full answer. And let's see how close we got. It says most fluorides are soluble in distilled water. Well, we already knew that, didn't we? However, the presence of fluoride ions in tap water limits its ability to dissolve as much solid calcium fluoride due to the common ion effect. Ionic compounds such as calcium fluoride are extremely polar in nature, which means they will be almost completely insoluble in a nonpolar solvent such as benzene. So hopefully you can see some applications of KSP, and common ion effect, and we have Le Chatelier's principle thrown in there as well. So we have some, some sample questions. These are more conceptual in nature, although you may have some essays, some multiple choice questions in there as well. And once again, if this is all completely um, confusing to you, you might want to go back and watch the two previous videos in this series about calculating KSP, finding molar solubility, solubility in grams per liter, uh, Q versus K, and determining if a precipitate is even going to form. I hope you learned something from this video today. If you did, if you'd be so kind as to hit that like button, I'd really appreciate it. That way, YouTube will share my chemistry videos with other uh, chemistry students as well. Like I said, my name is Jeremy Krug, and I've been teaching AP Chemistry for over 20 years, and I want you to get a 5 on your AP Chemistry exam and to get an A in your general chemistry class. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again where we can learn some more chemistry together.